personal freedom, political liberty, and free speech, defended by force of arms if necessary. Welcome to the Resistance Library from Ammo.com, where we believe that arming our fellow Americans both physically and philosophically helps them fulfill our founding fathers' intent with the Second Amendment to serve as a check on state power. Hello, everyone. I'm Dave Trillo, and you're listening to the Resistance Library podcast on Ammo.com. I'm here today with Sam Jacobs, and he's going to enlighten us about Wounded Knee, which is not just a reason you would stop playing baseball. (laughs) Yeah. Um, This is one of those things that, like, I wish that I I, I knew – you know, more about like my mother loves, loves, uh, some book about wounded knee, um, that she read when she was like, you know, in elementary school and stuck with her. It's one of the most significant battles in American history. It basically ended the Indian wars and was, you know, I mean, after the, um, civil war was over, the American government and military, basically directed their attention to uh, the remaining Native Americans, who I will probably mostly refer to as Indians throughout this, and so do pretty much every Indian I've ever met in my life. Slava Zizek has an interesting thing about that that you should Google that I'm not going to get into. But um, So, yeah, this is like the kind of final uh, defeat of the Indians out West. I know that there's going to be two objections to this statement. The first is going to be that there were further defeats after this. Uh, the other will be that, well, they weren't, you know, they're, they're not actually defeated and they will rise again. And yes, I know there were other battles and, uh, no, I think, I think the Indians are pretty much beat, um, by this though. Hey, I mean, Casinos are a uh, lucrative revenue stream, but that's another <laughs> topic with a lot of strange yeah. stuff about it as well. Well, they have their own I... country in Asia now, so good for them. <laughs> uh, um, what people don't know about Wounded Knee and the massacre that took place there, um, which, you know, like, I, I don't want to be disingenuous about any of this, like... I'm real glad that we, you know, conquered the West. Um, and I don't, again, I don't want to, I don't, I, I don't want to do this under false pretenses. Uh, I think that massacres are bad and, you know, uh, but I think that c- conquest is kind of just the way of the world. Um, and I, you know, it's better to conquer than be conquered. And I'm out west right now and loving it. And, you know, so I'm I, the Wounded Knee Massacre, I'm sure, was bad. But I'm, I'm glad that America uh, conquered the west. But the weird thing about it is that, um, that it's one of the first federal gun confiscations in American history. And it's weird to kind of even put it in those terms because, you know, there's a whole thing about, well, the Indians aren't. American citizens and they're, you know, subject to tribal authority. I think until, I think until 1925, they like weren't allowed to vote because it was just like, what do you need to vote in our elections for? You're, you know, you're an Indian, go vote in your tribal elections. But yeah, they massacred 300 unarmed people. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that's bad. So during the late 19th century, Uh, Indians were allowed to purchase and carry firearms basically the same way that, uh, white men were, there were colonial gun laws that did not, uh, bar Indians from possessing firearms, sort of, there were definitely places where you weren't supposed to have a gun if you were an Indian, Hmm. um, both during the colonial period and the, you know, the, the post-colonial, uh, post-revolutionary Period. Was that codified in any way, or was it just... Yeah, they were just passed a law, like, Indians can't have guns. Yeah, that's codified. You no, know, like, that was it. Yeah, we, yeah, uh, the, you know, the House of uh, Burgesses or whatever got together and passed a law, and Indians aren't allowed to own guns. We better not catch you with a gun if you're an Indian. And, hmm. 
you know, but I think that, uh, a lot of times the law wouldn't have addressed that because it just wouldn't have occurred to them to make a law about what Indians could or couldn't have because like Indians are, you know, somewhere else Mm -hmm. almost by definition. It would be like if we codify, if we said Thai people can't have guns now. Right. And it's like, okay, cool. You know, they're in Thailand. Um, But yeah. So, I mean, the, the thing that's, you know, interesting about Wounded Knee and the massacre that took place there was that, uh, you know, they had been, they had their guns confiscated uh, prior to it. And, you know, there's like the, 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 one of the things they say in this article is that unarmed people and their own government, I don't think that it's frankly accurate or fair to describe the United States government as the government of the Indians for the you know, I mean, unless your like claim is that, you know, at this time, the American government simply had dominion over anyone who happened to be on the United States landmass, which I think is a really anachronistic way of looking at this. I think that I would probably frame it as like, you know, what the government will do to like <laughs> basically anyone, you know, if they if they're in the way or they're easy enough to bully or they're causing enough of a problem. Um, but I don't think it's accurate to call the United States government the, the government of the Indians because for the most part, Indians were, you know, they had their own, I don't know, government's really even the right word for it, but they had their own kind of, you know, systems of authority. But anyway, um, we'll get more into that as we go on. So at the beginning of the 19th century, there were about 600,000 Indians living in the land that is now the United States. Um, by the end of the century, that diminished to fewer than 150,000. Um, I think that it's worth noting that there were a variety of reasons for that, uh, one of which it was one of the big ones that I think that it is necessary to mention every time you talk about the subject is th- that they largely lacked uh, immunities to common diseases that Westerners had immunities to the most, you know, kind of famous being smallpox. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's other things like getting chased off their land. And, you know, uh, the Comanche are actually a really interesting tribe to, you know, Indian people to read about because, we have these images of like Comanche warriors on, you know, horseback. And they're these, like the violent Indians of the plains, the plains Indians in general, like have this reputation as being these, you know, fearsome warriors who were not the kind of, um, you know, this five civilized tribes of the Southeast or these, you know, lackadaisical hippies that were in the Northeast, which neither of those are, accurate anyway but um but the comanche and the plains indians have this reputation as these like fearsome warriors (laughs) and it's it's well deserved but the reason that they're fearsome warriors is because like that's not what they were like before the before the europeans got there they were basically they basically were indians who went road warrior uh because they had their entire uh culture had been destroyed by the arrival of, of Europeans into the area. And they got, I think, the, I think most of them were originally from like the upper great lakes area and they got, and I could totally be wrong about all this, but this is what I, I'm just saying what I remember about it. Uh, and, and so, you know, these fearsome horse mounted warriors with like guns, you know, yeah, it's like, it's Mad Max. It's like yeah. Indian Mad mm. Max stuff. Well, those um, were the ones that have been left. It sounds like. Yeah, right, right. So, I mean, it's badass with a rifle. You would have been uh, called by disease or European settlers. Right, right. So a lot of the nomadic tribes, again, a lot of these guys weren't the Northeast and the Southeast. I don't know how nomadic some of these groups are. I mean, I don't think I think some of them were adopting agriculture and whatnot. So I don't know that how nomadic they were and I'm not an expert on this, but I'm just trying to provide a little nuance to the subject that I think uh, is often lacking when talking about the native population of the United States, but they were pushed into what were called Indian territories, uh, which were, you know, federal 
federally designated areas that started during the Creek War uh, of 1813 to 1815. Andrew Jackson kind of was one, this was one of his uh, moments that made him who he was. And, um, you know, George Washington was a guy who said, okay, you know, let's civilize the Indians, which means make them into Westerners, basically. And uh, that was his method of, you know, how are we going to deal with the natives? Well, George Washington said, well, you know, teach them Christianity and teach them how to read and write and teach them the principles of Republican government. And, uh, and that'll do it. Uh, Jackson said, nope, we're taking their stuff which mostly meant their land. Uh, And he signed the Indian Removal Act in 1830. It was one of the first pieces of legislation that kind of made, officially codified the status of Native Americans as second-class citizens or non-citizens. Davy Crockett was the only delegate from Tennessee to vote against the act. I believe that that was one of the main reasons why he split with Jackson was that he was horrified by the Indian removal act. So the Plains Indians, they lived between the Mississippi river and the Rocky mountains. Um, they were not really as impacted by the U S government because like they're, you know, the West truly was wild back then. There was not a lot out there. So, but people moved past the Mississippi and onto the frontier. And that's when things kind of got a little dicey. Um, the Fort Laramie Treaty was signed in 1851 that granted the Plains Indians about 150 million acres of land for their own use as the Great Sioux Reservation. Uh, 13 years later, it was reduced by 90 million acres in the Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868. And then um, I think that there's a typo there. It's 17 year difference. Um, but anyway. There's this is all a common tale. I mean, everybody knows that the treaties that the Indians um, made with the United States government were not worth the paper that they were written on. Um, I don't think that this is really news to anybody listening to this, that the the United States government has a very bad track record of honoring their treaties with Indians. Um, you know, I think basically uh, power is the only real law in the world. And so if you are shocked and horrified by this, uh, I would urge you to grow up um, because <laughs> that's just the way of the world. Um, and it's unfortunate if you're on the business end of it. But uh, that's, I think, all you can really say about it. There, so one of the things was that there was no um, non Indians. It basically, like the, 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 the reservations had a bit more teeth back then. So, it wasn't if you ever seen the show Deadwood, um, one of the things that they are talking about is like, we're not really supposed to be here, you know, because this is Indian land and there's no law of any kind, and you know. This is this is Indian land. We're not supposed to be here. I could be mistaken, but I think that the original area where Deadwood was settled, like the, the settlers got chased off by the United States Army, I think, at some point. But yeah, that was another thing you had to worry about if you were going to go settle on Indian land was that like, you know, the army was going to come through and go, what are you doing? Get off. You're not supposed to be here. Um, you were not allowed to come onto the reservation. Sioux were allowed to hunt in an area around the, this territory. Uh, but if non Indians wanted to settle anywhere in this gigantic area, they had, they, you had to get the permission of the Sioux hmm. did they to ever, do it. Did they ever give it? I doubt it. I doubt the, I doubt they were, uh, you know, I doubt they were in any hurry to let any white man anywhere near any of their stuff. And with good reason. Yeah. And with good, with good reason. So that was all well and good until, drum roll, um, they found gold in the South Dakota Black Hills. And boy, if you know anything about American history with regard to the native population, 
you know where this is going. Because that's like, the treaties are good until we find something that we need or want on your land. And then, you know, all bets are off. So, the, you know, they found the gold there in 1874 in the Black Hills. The show Deadwood is, is basically all about this period of time. I, I, um, I like Deadwood quite a bit. I recommend it to people who, you know, are interested uh, in... I think that it's a, I think it has an interesting, um, critique of problems of libertarianism and the degree to which libertarianism can scale. I think that it has interesting things to say about, uh, power and how power is exercised. I think that it is interesting in its characterizations of men living in this frontier lifestyle. Uh, and I also think, you know, it's cool. It's got gunfights and dudes biting each other's ears off and, lots of swearing and, you know, other things that make movies and TV shows great. Is it better than Little House on the Prairie? You know, man, I don't think I've ever seen an episode of Little House on the Prairie. Somebody needs to come take my Gen Xer card away because I, my brother used to watch that show like crazy. But I don't think I've ever seen an episode of it. And I am a man who is like the quintessential the quintessential Gen Xer when it comes to old television shows. Um, but I just, I've never seen little house on the prairie for some reason. I know it's got Michael Landon and I think that's really all I know about little house. It was on all the time when I was a kid too, but yeah. I never watched it. You know, you it was know, on all the time in reruns when I was a kid. It's I never interesting watched it. to me now that you say that, I mean, I watched it and I don't remember anything about it. One thing. I, I know, might have I seen know it, it had like when a I was three year old really Jason Bateman in it. No kidding. Yeah, he played uh, one of the little kids. Crazy. I had no idea. And I am, as I said, a, a, a bit of an old television nerd. That's where my, that's where the Gen Xer really comes out is like, you start talking to me about, you now, know, uh, now, Dr. different Quinn, Strokes episodes. That and I can we're tell gonna, you anything about. about. See, I watched that when I was a super, super little kid, and I don't remember any of it. Because I was on. too little to remember it. I know it's a weird show. I actually used to live in one of the last PBS markets that showed it, but it was the, 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 cause the guy who dresses like a cricketer the guy after Tom, whatever his name is anyway. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't remember. That's the show. I know I've, my mother tells me I used to watch all the time, but I have like absolutely no memory of whatsoever, but Deadwood good show uh, about this history, this period of time. That's, you know, sort of historically accurate. It's what we call poetic truth. You know, like, uh, there's no such thing, there's no such place on earth as South Detroit. But can you imagine, don't stop believing any other way? Hmm. North Detroit, East Detroit, West Detroit? No, it's got to be South Detroit. <laughs> um, and there's that sort of, uh, you know, poetic truth to Deadwood, that it, when, while not strictly speaking factual, tells the truth in a poetic and metaphorical way. So yeah, they want the, they want the gold land and you know, the government just says, well, that's the treaties, you know, all well and good, but we're taking your stuff anyway, uh, as they do over and over and over and over again. And I think like one, of, it's like a really lazy joke to be like, why are the Indians keep falling for it? I don't think they were falling for it. I think they were, you know, striking out the best deal they could for as long as they could keep it enforced, knowing full well that, uh, you know, the, the, the United States government was going to take all of their stuff, the nanosecond that it became worth the effort. Mm -hmm. So the Indians keep getting pushed into smaller and smaller territories. Uh, obviously, you know, if particularly if you're a nomadic people, and you're in your hunter people um, having smaller and smaller hunting lands, you know, is going to impact your quality of life. Uh, there's also the sort of non material results, the what you might call spiritual or emotional impact of seeing all of your lands, you know, taken by uh, the pale face and in 1889, the United States government passed the Dawes Act, which 
took the Black Hills from the Indians, broke up the Sioux Reservation into five separate reservations, and took 9 million acres and opened it up for public purchase by non-Indians for homesteading and settlements. Um, the Indians were pushed onto smaller and smaller territories that did not have enough game to support them. The bison were gone. Um, there is actually quite a bit of evidence that it was not the Americans who killed off the bison, that it was, there was a method of like basically proto industrial, uh, meat production where certain Indian tribes, I don't know if the Sioux was one of them, but would, uh, you basically would herd, take a herd of Buffalo and like drive them to the edge of a cliff Mm. and then just start like herding them off of a cliff and gathering all the meat at the bottom of the cliff. Um, this is, you know, my, my point being that like, uh, it was not Americans that were the only factor in the near extinction of the Buffalo. I believe people used to think that the Buffalo was extinct. I think it got that bad with, with the, the American bison. And I'm glad that they're back first of all, because they're delicious. Second of all, because I hate <laughs> that's, that's any, why they reffed up in the first place. Right. Secondly, because I hate to see any, you know, anything except mosquitoes and cockroaches go the way of the dodo. Hmm. Um, and you know, third of all, it's like, it's like the bald Eagle or the wild Turkey or something. It's like, this is it's such a symbol of America that I would be, I'm, I'm glad they, they saved it. So yeah, the, their ancestral lands, which again, like, I don't think these were their ancestral lands. I'm pretty sure that these were people who had been driven west by the, uh, and had like displaced other Indians while doing so. Mm. But if I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Yeah. So their resistance was pretty well broken by this point. You know, they were in reservations. Uh, they had less than 9 million acres that was all through South Dakota and not in one spot. And, uh, they were the federal government encouraged them to start, you know, growing food on farms and it's not a real great place for growing stuff, which means they didn't have a lot of food. They were undercounted in the census. I'm not even going to hazard a guess if that was on purpose or by accident. Um, neither would really surprise me. And they got, that meant that they got, you know, less supplies than they were supposed to from the United States government. And so people were starving. There was a flu epidemic, which, you know, is actually was the flu epidemic can be a big deal now. Um, but it was a way big deal back then if it was nasty enough and that it was the type of flu that killed off children, a lot of children. And so a lot of Sioux children died. Uh, and that was, you know, obviously to say the least, very upsetting for the Sioux people. And there was a drought in the summer of 1890. So they're just like, and that has destroyed all their crops. And particularly in the Lakota Pine Bridge Indian Reservation, things were really hard. But as you can see, there's like, there's a whole kind of wave of disasters that befall these people. And that's the thing is like, I don't want people to think that I'm like, no, I, I, I'm, I'm being a little bit glib about this, but like, I don't want people to think that I don't think that this is tragic because I certainly do. I just, the kind of like pearl clutching about the way that people with, uh, access to gunpowder treated people who were still struggling with agriculture. I, I don't know why anybody would be the least bit surprised, uh, or shocked by that because I think that's pretty much all of human history. Uh, but this is obviously some very tragic stuff, you know, and I honestly like, I think that we really can see how the loss of the land impacted these people. And I think that that is maybe a place that we should dwell on for a second, because, you know, I think that it's easy to be like, oh, they lost their land and, you know, who cares, just get new land or use less land or whatever. And I think that you know, far beyond the kind of practical considerations of it, uh, that they're, that these, these, this is a broken people. These are people who have been broken, I guess is a better way of putting it. And so, you know, the, like the famine and the flu and the everything else that comes out and the drought is like kind of just icing on the cake, but also a not, um, 
a not terribly, you know, surprising consequence. So that's that's the situation that they're in. And this is kind of leads to the spread of this. I mean, I don't know that there's a there, there's like a direct correlation between it, but basically there's this new religious movement called the Ghost Dance, and it's not terribly surprising that there would be a new religious movement in in given these um, circumstances. So there was a leader of the Sioux who had a vision, uh, and basically that the, there was going to be a uh, messiah who was going to be an Indian who was going to deliver. The people force the white man off the Indian's land, return the buffalo to the plains, resurrect the dead, and bring back the old way of life. The ghost dance was an actual dance. It was not a war dance, but people were very intimidated by it, and people thought it was a war dance. So there's a man named Daniel Royer who arrived on the scene at the Pine Ridge Reservation in October of 1890. Um, he believed that there was going to be a war dance and requested troops from Benjamin uh, Harrison, who was president at that time. Indians are dancing in the snow and are wild and crazy. We need protection and we need it now, is what his telegram read. I, um, you know, not necessarily going to second guess his assessment of the situation, but I. I doubt very much that uh, the Indians were any threat to Americans at that time because they had been pretty thoroughly whipped by this point in history. Um, so, but Harrison, you know, sends out part of the seventh cavalry and they arrive on November 20th and they are ordered to arrest the leaders of the Sioux. And they are led by uh, James Forsyth, who's and they attempt to arrest Sitting Bull, who was the guy who, um, you know, wrecked General George Custer in the Battle of Little Bighorn. And man, I have uh, I've driven through Little Bighorn, and whew, it is not uh, not a nice area. But um, you know, he I don't know what the actual year difference is, but he'd been touring with Buffalo Bills Wild West show and, and very close with Annie Oakley. Uh, but they wanted to arrest him because he didn't stop the ghost dance movement. <laughs> so the Lakota and they go to arrest him and he's shot and killed like basically for nothing. You know, this is, this is kind of get, I think that like, the, there's probably a lot of parallels, parallels to Waco with this, but like, yeah, there these, you know, they shot and killed Sitting Bull for like no reason at all. Lakota, you know, understandably get very nervous about this. And the tribal leader, whose name was Bigfoot, which is awesome, um, he was a ghost dance guy and he caught the attention of federal agents. Yeah, I think the Waco parallels are like actually quite significant here because they've got this weird religious movement as well. So Bigfoot and his tribe. They go to the Badlands. Seventh Cavalry chases after them for five days, but Bigfoot got pneumonia, and uh, they were, you know, peaceably intercepted at Wounded Creek, Wounded Knee Creek, on December twenty eighth. The next day, there's the massacre. So the next morning, Colonel Forsyth, who again is the commanding officer here, um, demands that the tribe surrender their firearms and um, rifles are being you know turned over without issue everybody just kind of gives up their guns which was probably not wise but they also probably didn't have a great deal of uh choice in matter these were all hunters right yeah this this was a you know they were would, hunting would they have gone back to bows and arrows it was turning over their rifles tantamount to agreeing to starve um, I think that I don't really know. I mean, I don't know how much they were hunters really at that point because they, again, they're on the reservations again, you know? Hmm. So yeah, I don't, I don't know to what degree they're still hunters. So I don't think it is actually tantamount to uh, the kind of social suicide in that respect. But I do think it was, 
you know, in retrospect, well, I doubt many of them had any illusions that they were getting out of this thing alive. Mm -hmm. So they are turning over the rifles without issue. And some of the men start ghost dancing. Um, that obviously ratcheted up the tensions. And a few minutes later, a Sioux man named black coyote refused to give up his rifle. It's believed by some that Black Coyote was actually deaf and had recently purchased his rifle and didn't understand why the soldier was demanding it. But there was a scuffle over this weapon and the gun discharged. Uh, the Seventh Cavalry, who uh, was part of which this was Custer's regiment that had been you know put back together after they were wrecked at Little Bighorn. Yeah, I'm amazed there was anything left. Yeah, well, they they had to, you know they shift the guys around and put a new one together. They started opening fire on the Lakota. Um, they also used a revolving barrel machine gun that fired sixty eight rounds a minute. Ooh, a Maxim. Um, a Hotchkiss. A Hotchkiss. They had four of them, and they you know again these were people who were except for this one guy was were hand, handing over their weapons. Men, women, and children scattered. Cavalry pursued them. Uh, dead bodies were later found as far as three miles from the camp. Once the firing ended, it was about two hours later. Uh, there was a hundred Native Americans dead in the snow. At least half of them were women and children, and those who didn't die immediately froze to death in a blizzard that came after. It's about a week later, the cavalry escorted a burial party to the banks of the Wounded Knee River, where they buried 146 in a single mass grave. Other bodies were found in the surrounding areas, and the estimated total body count is between 250 and 300 Sioux. The 7th Cavalry lost 25 men. So that was the end of any significant resistance by the uh, Native Americans. There was also, it was also the end of the ghost dance. Because one of the things I, I this could be one of those things that people say that it's like, oh, wow, these you know crazy savages kind of thing. But uh, I think it's actually true that they thought that if you go stance that like bullets would bounce off you. Hmm. But if that's like a myth, then I apologize. It's just a thing that I again, think I remember. So lots, nobody really like, I mean, that's the thing they get back and like no one's, no one in the military is super happy about it. Forsyth's commanding officer calls it a criminal military blunder and a horrible massacre of women and children. I think that there's this like unfair image of uh, the American military during this time as these kind of like bloodthirsty Indian killers. And I think that that's not accurate and that, you know, the military brass were probably pretty horrified by this. President Harrison, however, was you know, running for re-election and they want to look bad and was um, running against, um, I think he would have been running, well, let's, let's look it up. I believe he's running against um, Grover Cleveland. Um, and indeed he was, uh, which was, that was when Grover Cleveland uh, was running for his second term. People will remember that Grover Cleveland was the only president to serve two non-consecutive terms. He ran and won, and then Benjamin Harrison beat him in a heavily disputed election. Um, and Grover Cleveland basically never stopped running. And, you know, Benjamin Harrison uh, had every reason to think that he would lose to him, and he ultimately did. So he dismissed the report that was given by General Nelson Miles. Um, didn't really, he didn't want to look bad, and Obviously, he would have had he, you know, began some kind of investigation into an Indian massacre. Um, he paraded the cavalrymen around as heroes who defeated uh, the, you know, savages. That's in big, heavy air quotes um, uh, out on the plains. In the spring of 1891, the president awarded the first of 20 medals of honor to the soldiers who disarmed and slaughtered the Sioux at Wounded Knee. They again regrouped after this 7th Cavalry, um, but it's speculated that this kind of like reassembled 7th Cavalry um, was looking for a fight after Little Bighorn. Um, or I, a fight mate isn't even really the right word that they were like. They wanted some kind of payback for the events of Little Bighorn. 
um, and that they got it, you know, at Wounded Knee. Hmm. Uh, Black Elk was one of the few survivors he recalled in 1931. I can still see the butchered women and children lying heaped and scattered all along the crooked gulch as a plain as one I saw with eyes still young. And I can see that something else died there in the bloody mud and was buried in the blizzard. A people's dream died there. <laughs> ah, it's just a shame all this had to happen. Um, yeah, I mean, it's what more can you really? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, what more can you really? Be, it's, um, it's, it's it's like jumping off a building and then pissing and moaning about gravity. But in spite of everything else, it would just be too callous to say it's just not horrendous the way it all went down, as inevitable as it may have been. Yeah, it's 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 pretty yucky, you know, because like it's not, um, you know, f- which I think is probably why they were, you know, the general didn't care for it. It's like, you know, it's one thing to it's one thing to beat an army of men, but it's another thing entirely to, you know, just kind of shoot at a bunch of old people and children, women who are having their arms taken away from them. Um, And I, you know, maybe I'm a naive person, but I do think that that sense of honor was much more present in among the military elites of this country during that time um, than it is today. Again, maybe I'm maybe I'm naive. Well, is there any parallel to be drawn now? Maybe uh, a warning against voluntary disarmament? (sighs) Yeah, I mean, I think that like. I mean, I think it's, I don't know, because I think that the whole thing about like, why'd they give up their guns? It's like, what else were they going to do? You know, it's like the like, hey, they keep getting tricked. It's like, no, they weren't tricked. They knew what was going to happen. They knew what was going to happen when they signed these trees. Maybe they didn't the first 60 times it happened. But like, by this point, yeah, I think they had a pretty clear picture of like where all this was going. You know, it gets back to the thing that I said earlier that like, the only real law in this world is power. It's not the most pleasant fact to sit with, but you know, people who have power make laws for everyone else. Um, and I think that, you know, I don't, um, I think that resisting disarmament is probably a wise decision, but how effective it will be. I don't know. And I hope we don't ever find out. So, You should stock up on ammo, though. (laughs) That's a given. Yeah, you should. I mean, you know, even if you're going to do a little plinking in the backyard or what have you, but it's all you never have too much ammo. And uh, that's why I would urge you to go to ammo.com forward slash podcast where you can get $20 off uh, any purchase of $200 or more. We've got every kind of ammo you could need. If you do bench rest shooting, you do, you know. Plinking in your backyard, you're a hunter, you're, you know, getting ready for the impending collapse of civilization. Um, we have got everything that you need at ammo.com forward slash podcast. Get $20 off, $200 or more. For Dave Trello, this is Sam Jacobs, and thank you for joining us on the Resistance Library podcast from ammo.com. Mm-hmm.